Hey guys, so this is Will. Say hi, Will. Hi, everybody. Um, Will is one of the best players in the world. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, yes, my name is Will Anderson, a uh, Scrabble player since about 2009, originally from New York State. Um, have played word games competitively much longer than that, and uh, honored to be here with this video and uh, you know, see if I can help out. All right, so today we're going to go over David Gibson. So this is David Gibson. Um, as you can see, he's really good. Very high rating. Uh, if you can see this money graph over here, he wins for at least catches in basically every tournament he plays. It's a lot of money. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, not a lot of money, but you know, it's one hundred and sixty-two thousand three hundred eighty-seven dollars over the course. World, of, yes. Yeah. yeah. So Gibson's always been kind of an enigma, and a lot of people really try to figure out how to play against him. I've had a horrible time beating Gibson personally, so one day I just decided to go through Gibson's games and was like, okay, I'm tired of losing to Gibson, I'm tired of everybody else losing to Gibson, what am I going to do against Gibson? And I was talking to Will, and I was just like, well, you know, I've done all this research, why don't I make a video out of it? So and I said, absolutely, you know, it's, uh, you're not the only person who's kind of walked back home, hat in hand, wondering, how do I beat this guy? And for those that don't know, in the Scrabble world, when you clinch a tournament before it's over, that's known as Gibsonizing. That's, that's how synonymous he is with winning. So that should tell you all you need to know <laughs> about him. You know? Yeah. So yeah, uh, first thing I want to say is this isn't really going to be a tutorial about Gibson per se, as much as I want you to focus on how to beat any specific player that's giving you problems. So whether it's just your local expert, whether it's you know Nigel Richards or playing me or Will or something like that, you can do this against anybody. And I'd encourage you to. I would love to see a game where this sort of thing was commonplace, where people would do this all the time. It happens in other games, it happens in sports, it happens in fighting games. I would love to see lots of adjusting and readjusting to different opponents. So first thing you do, um, first thing that I did, is you go through Gibson, you try to get a good idea of how he plays. So Gibson's normally considered to be a very defensive player, and that's supposed to be like his modus operandi, like he's really good at defense. Um... And to some degree, that's true. To some degree, it's a misnomer, and he gets a lot of mileage just based on the fact that that's what people think of him. He does have a lot more in his arsenal, and he's actually not as defensive as people think. And you know, we'll go over that over the next X minutes. A lot of people think that the best way to respond to this is by opening the board, and that's where he makes his money. <laughs> uh, that's not what to do. That's not what you should ever do against... Well, I wouldn't say that's not what you should never do against Gibson, but you need to do it very early, and you need to not panic when the board starts closing. A lot of times you actually just need to let him. Um, you know, if you start with Bingo Bango, or you know, you have an option between an open and a closed board, by all means, go ahead. But that's normally not what happens. So, yeah. First thing you do is you look at his cross table stats. Head to head records. I always think that this is the first thing you should look at whenever you look at any opponent. And particularly their bad ones. So, I don't know everybody here. I'm not going to pretend like I know every single Scrabble player, but I do certainly know a few. Uh, Doug Rockmeyer, I know personally. Um, very good friend of mine. Um, pretty defensive player. And you can actually notice a theme, especially at the bottom. A lot of these players are not exactly shootout players. Dave Leifer is a very close board player. Uh, Doug Brockmeyer already said. Uh, Chris Cree, not exactly known for being a very open board player. Uh, Joe Weineke, etc., etc. And Joel Sherman. Um, who's also very noticed, who's 
I wouldn't say as an open board player, but you know, he's kind of in between. Uh, he has a very certain style, specific style, which I'll get to later. But you'll actually see that he actually struggles a little bit more against closed board players than against Joel. And Joel does something very specific, and I think you can mix the closed boredness of those players and Joel's style and do fairly well. Um, next thing I'm going to look at is, and the next thing you should always look at, is the annotated games. And there's a lot of them. So, annotated games. Oops. Hold on a sec, guys. Um, so as you can see, every player has a library of annotated games. And, you know, it's not reasonable to go through all of them. I haven't, I haven't even gone through all of them. I've gone through probably about 40 or 50 of them. Um, basically what you're doing is you're just cataloging for mistakes or things that you think are peculiar. And you say to yourself, okay, I would not have done that. How would I counteract that? And with Gibson, it's a little bit harder because you don't actually have Gibson's racks in 95% of the games that you see. So you have to kind of make judgments and inferences. And, you know, maybe there's something that you're missing, but, you know, there's still going to be plays that look kind of weird. Um, you just have to go through that and just say to yourself, okay, what is he making that mistakes and what should I do about it? And Would once you, you start out with the handful of games um, where you do have David's racks as well, even if it's as low as, you know, 5% of the games total? If you started there, it might be, I don't know, even if there's only a handful, maybe that's the best kind of bang for your buck. Or yeah, if you only have, if you know which games those are, <laughs> even Gibson, you know, you have right. really old games with often very old lexicons. <laughs> um, right. So it's kind of hard to do that, but that's you're definitely better off. And Gibson's kind of unique in this. Most players have fracks, so it makes your life a lot easier. But yeah, so I went and cataloged this um, into a few categories. So first I'm going to go over the general findings of what I got. Gibson loves quadrant control. He likes to take one piece of the board and just close it entirely. Usually it's this quadrant. It's the top left quadrant. Uh, the vast majority of games that Gibson plays, he tries to close this quadrant very, very quickly. Um, which, you know, is normally not a bad option. You know, it's a pretty common tactic in high-level play. Uh, it does mean that he might be a little bit more prone to, you know, more unusual plays. Um, open, opening vertically might even be something that works against him, I don't really know. But usually when somebody has one quadrant or one area, they're trying to close every single game. Um, either playing off center or opening vertically or doing that is important. But what's most important is that you keep quadrants in play. You want to make sure that you always have access to the entire board at all times. You don't want, like, you know, a J here or, you know, a Q here, for example, because it just makes your life very difficult trying to get to this region of the board. But, you know, the vast majority of games Gibson plays, he's opening horizontally. So if you open vertically, it just kind of throws off the dimensions a little bit. May or may not work. Um, I think it's definitely worth trying against Gibson specifically. I don't think it really matters against 95% player, of players that you play. But if somebody's doing... Most of what Gibson wants to do is reduce entropy. And because you're an underdog, um, if you're behind, you really don't want to reduce entropy. But Gibson doesn't care. He just reduces entropy because it creates situations where he's a lot more comfortable. And if you want to counter this strategy, there's really two ways. The first way is to make it more difficult to play on the board. The first thing is to make him in situations where he's not comfortable. In other words, increase the amount of points that he needs to sacrifice if he wants to create his closed board. In essence, you're saying, okay, you can have the board that you want, but I'm going to tax you for it. And that way he's just giving you points, and eventually he's going to be behind on a closed board and just outmaneuver him. Um, which is really the second thing you want to do. You want to just let him get the closed board, and then once he's behind, you just want to outplay him on it. That's really the key to beating Gibson, I think. 
I think that's really important. There's a big difference between reducing entropy and reducing risk. So as most of you know, entropy is a concept where you're trying to take away bingo lines. where And you're trying to take away large swings in the score. That a lot of times means sacrificing equity. So if the score is tied, it doesn't make any sense to reduce entropy. Gibson does that all the time. And, you know, he gets into a lot of closed board situations where he's trying to induce mistakes. He's trying to get you to open the board. He's trying to get other people to open the board so that he can capitalize on it. So in a lot of cases, what you're stuck doing is actually playing a more defensive game against Gibson. Um, so some examples of that. Um, let me close this window. Ugh. So here's a case where Gibson hates floaters. Um, he was playing Sid. Sid lives in his region. And you know, I've heard lots of stories like this. And you know, Gibson's up by 200 points. And he goes, David starts muttering, so I hope he has a bad rack. Then two minutes later, he says he's really sorry and throws down trifles here for 72. Then he takes it back after another minute and changes it to free hole is for 86. After the game, he says he was angry with himself for not playing trifles for 14 fewer and called himself greedy and stupid for playing like Wackle. Um, and the reason for that is because of the C and then the R here. Uh, he really, really, really hates floaters. <laughs> A lot. Um, and when somebody hates something like that, usually you should try to reenact that. So, you know, floaters are really good against Gibson, um, just in general. Not extremely good, but they're pretty good in general. Um, however, the real problem and the real thing that Gibson takes great pain to avoid is hooks. And a lot of times they really wreck a low entropy strategy. And the reason for this is that a hook can automatically change a board from being very, very low entropy to very high entropy very, very quickly. And as you can see, he takes great pain to close hooks some of the time. Um, here's an example. Uh, he's playing, you know, 1600. And his opponent plays Panto. And, you know, there's actually lines on the board. Um, there's this line, there's this line, there's this line. And he's not up by that much. He's up by 28. And as you can see, Gibson plays LI for 8. In a situation where I think almost nobody would have. And the main reason for that is because this hook is a hook. It's a nuisance. The rest of this stuff can all be closed, you know, via quadrants. And he doesn't have a good rack. It's pretty obvious. Um, his next play is Nur, then he plays Cram. It, it's not because he has a good rack. It's because there's a hook and it's a problem for him. Um, see another example of that. He's up by 20 against Matt Canick. There's a hook. No real indication that Matt has... A super strong rack, although he actually does have a decent rack this time. Plays SI for 14. Um, wow. Very, very odd, and probably, not probably, definitely not good. Um, if you're playing himself, he would probably never do this. Or at least I hope he wouldn't. It's, it's just not a good idea. Um, it gets him into a lot of trouble, and... You can keep doing this to him over and over and over again. You can keep creating hooks. There's plenty of places on most of these boards to hook to death, just over and over and over again. Um, and that's going to be the large part of your counterattack. You want to create situations where hooks are a big deal and where he's going to go out of his way to block them. And on most closed boards, you can do that. In most closed boards, there's some sort of way to create some play, you know, a play like Bin over here. Um, there's always going to be a way to make a hook that's going to be difficult to counteract. So even if you get behind against Gibson on a closed board, you know you're going to get your you're going to get your way back into the game just by doing these sorts of things over and over and over again. And he's not really somebody who blocks preemptively. You know he could have done something about this in you know a myriad of ways. He played you know the previous turn he played Vane for example. He could have done something about the hook before, really. Um, he could have just, you know, off those two tiles, he could have played Ava, um, which doesn't take an S, and, but he doesn't want to do that because it's a floater. <laughs> um, but that's the way he thinks about the game. He wants to minimize 
single lines and he wants to minimize large swings as much as possible and he's willing to spend an inordinate amount of, amount of points and leave to do so. Um, so, yeah, if you create something like, you know, I don't know, you create a board like this and, you know, something like this. I'm, I'm just making this up. Um, inordinately, Gibson will sacrifice huge amounts of points to block this S hook here. Um, he'll either make, you know, I don't know, some nonsensical play over here, or he'll sacrifice a bunch of points to play through here, or he'll play like a two tile play here, or something like that. Um, he hates these with a passion. And it, it ruins, you know, because it ruins the low entropy style that he has. He wants to create situations where there's very little risk, where he feels like he can outplay somebody. And if the score, it means it's a five or ten point game and he has to sacrifice his lead to do so, he'll do it because he has faith that he's going to outplay other people. So just don't let him outplay you. And you're generally going to be fine on closed boards. You shouldn't run from it, which is what most people do. So yeah, that's going to be a main component of what you do against Gibson. Um, Gibson's definitely also not invincible on closed boards. His reputation precedes him and that you should not attack him. You actually kind of should. You know, if you can get an open board, sure, fine, but it's really not necessary. And, you know, there's... So here's kind of an example where... You know, he's just kind of sort of sticking around here. So if he's losing, uh, pulls a mess, and, you know, he just drops an S here for 18 when he doesn't have the blank. Uh, this is the pool. Sid has this on, this has rack and one more tile. He just drops the S here, which is almost certainly not a good play. Um, but, you know, he's leaving two in the bag and he's trying to induce people to mess up. That's what he does, is just trying to induce lots and lots and lots of errors. And does a pretty good job of it most of the time. Um, yeah, and there's a few other examples of this as well. He does misplays. That's definitely a thing too. But yeah, his range is... His leave range is also very bad. When you take this much effort to close the board, you often have to leave like pretty bad tiles. So, for example, Terrace is not going to leave the best pool because you know he can't have anything in this rack. He played an S off for 18 points, and he kept Drek rather than keeping the S for a setup or some good play. And he does this a lot. He's very willing to just completely annihilate his rack for the purposes of... Basically just for the purposes of getting the type of board that he wants. The type of board that has very low risk that is going to induce a lot of errors. Yeah, very interesting. Um, it was certainly, I, I guess I had never analyzed before David's records against other closed board players. It's very surprising to see that uh, maybe the people who are very comfortable on the types of boards that David looks to create end up having a slightly elevated winning percentage against him for what you would expect. That's kind of an interesting finding. Um, I certainly uh, have not had great success against him, but it's only been three games, so it's hard to really know, but uh, I'll be eager to look back at those games and see if there's any of these concepts that I can apply and see if I handled it correctly. So. I mean, when you go back to the records, um, to his head-to-head -head records, like, most of the people who give him trouble are A, Joel, because Joel, Joel's a very hook-dependent player. Um, for those of you who haven't played Joel, Joel's very reliant on creating lots and lots of situations where there's a tile that he can just create an opening that 
you know, changes the board entirely. He's very, very proficient at it. He does it a lot. And as you can see, he's one of the few players who has a good winning percentage over a long sample against Gibson. Um, and he's very confident in the matchup, and I honestly think he's probably a favorite against Gibson, even though I think Gibson overall is just a much better player. Uh, because he's very used to creating situations where, oh, there's a closed board, let me create a fork, or you know, some sort of hook that's very difficult to block. He's very, very proficient at that. Probably Joel's strength, to be honest. And yeah, the rest of them are just defensive players who are mostly weaker players that, you know, he tries to put them in situations that are like, well, you know, I don't know what to do in open board situations, but here's a closed board situation. I'm very used to this. Right. And so, yeah, he has, you know, he has his way with them. I mean, even if you go further up the list, you know, the people who get in trouble, um, Ori, uh, Mark Nyman... Yeah, most of these people, I, I know that you, most of you guys don't know who these people are, but, you know, they're mostly people who are very proficient at closed boards. And the people who struggle against him are the people who just try to force the board, board open, who are just like, well, we have, you know, they have some sort of situation, like, you know, somebody opens QI like this, and they're like, well, we can't have that, so, you know, we have, you know, a perfectly good rack, we have... I don't know. I'm just making some something up now. Um, well, not that, because that's a bingo. But, you know, we have, you know, it's going to be a closed board because you have this queue here, so let's do something like this. And, yeah, it opens the board, but Gibson's word knowledge is perfectly good enough. He's still going to be able to close the board because that's what he does. He's going to... Yeah, you've opened this quadrant up, but he's either going to, you know, do something here and close it again, or he's going to you know, pick a different part of the board to corner off or something like that. That's what he wants to do. So when you panic like that, you're basically just inducing... You're basically just suiciding. You're playing in his hands. Yeah. You know, you're playing the game he wants you to play. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that's the basic gist of what you're going to get against Gibson. I think that if you remember... You know, the two main things are, A, get into a situation where when he closes the board, you have hooks as outs, because then he's going to spend all of this equity trying to close the board, and then you're just going to be like, oh, you know, you you want to spend 20 points, you know, you want to sacrifice 20 points? Okay, here. And then you open something, and he's either going to, you know, spend another 15 points to keep blocking it. And you don't even need to have it when, you know, you're creating an opening. You can just create an opening, and if you just threaten an opening or threaten a much better rack than you have, um, he's going to block it. He's not somebody who is going to be able to think on the level of, well, his range is, you know, Gibson's not one of these people, you know, he's an old school player. He doesn't think in terms of ranges or leave inferences or anything like that. And, you know, you can, if you remember that and you remember, you know, keeping all the quadrants open, um, he's going to have a very hard time. His reputation precedes him. He does make plenty of word knowledge mistakes. He makes a, you know, a fair number of leaf mistakes where it just doesn't make any sense what he could possibly have. Yeah, he gets flustered. He's a human being at the end of the day, um, which is something a lot of people forget. Every top player is a human being. And if you've ever seen Gibson on the end of the day, tournament, you know, you, you realize that, but there's there's a lot that you can do against that. Um, and just because it's an unusual style and it's had a lot of success doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> um, and, you know, it was a good style for a long time. And Aote games, I think, have changed that a lot. Because before nobody knew what Gibson did. And before nobody knew why he did, they just knew that he did it. And when you reach, when you see a style that you've never seen before, which is very defensive, but not very defensive, just very low entropy. And, yeah, it's unusual to see, and he sacrifices lots of points, and a lot of the times when he has these, you know, when he does these things, his leaves are pretty obviously bad. 
Um, let me see if I can find an example of that. I think I, I think I mentioned that before, but yeah. So like here he plays, he plays Kea, uh, which again I think is crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, this is an example. He hates hooks. He wants to block this side of the board. He has this side of the hook board mostly blocked. Um, so he plays Kea. He wants to you know preserve the board, and then his opponent plays Death, and then he plays Hosannas. Now, in the service, this just looks like a lucky sequence until you think about this in a moment and think about, well, he just played Kea, what does he have? <laughs> and the answer is not yeah. much. <laughs> this doesn't really make any sense if you think about it a little bit longer. There's lots of bingos um, that play here if he has the plank. If he has the S, there's lots of K plays or things like that. Or there's lots of hooks that go over here. There's lots of underlaps that go over here. But he's probably doing something a little funky because he wants to block this side of the board off. But in doing so, he's sacrificing a lot of equity. Because there just there has to be a 35-point yeah. play. There just has to be one with whatever he has. Combinations of letters that that are part of his bingo that he must have had when he played Kea and pretty much all of them should yield something better than what he did in terms of equity, far better. Yeah. Something with the S, something like Oaken. I mean, any of it, any of the even just Oaks. <laughs> yeah. There's just and any. You know, the turn he, before he played J-O-T-A, too, so it's not like he, which I'm assuming he did in part because the J and because floaters, <laughs> and because of this D-hook. Yeah. Um, you know, he's just over and over and over, and this isn't like an isolated position. This is just kind of a position that I just threw out there. This is something he does all the time. You know, he he's sacrificing a lot to do this, and you know you have to be able to. If he's gonna, if somebody really wants to shape the board in the way that they want to, they you know you just let them. You know, if they have a forty point lead, you know, on a closed board, well that means they could have probably had an eighty point lead on an open board. So you're in bad shape either way. And at the end of the day, you can probably create something that you know makes your life easier. It's not like this is really gonna be that effective all of the time. And, you know, all you need to do is make some sort of hook here. <laughs> and that's yeah, always so going to be a problem. Play of Delft is probably, six play of Delft is probably especially good to create that, not just S, but also very dangerous A hook. It's going to make a kind of a red alert for him to deal with that at all costs and such amounts of points and lead to do so. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't recommend playing Delft out of, you know, in general, but... You know, something I would probably recommend playing something like Dell instead because that creates more yeah, of a I was problem. Yeah, maybe say Dell might be a safer way to make a big hook that doesn't have such negative downside. In general, I would not recommend playing Death for the same. You know, for that reason, I would want to try to play somewhere else on the board just to kind of leave this sort of thing open, if really at all possible. So, you know, something like Hodge or something like that. You kind of want to play down. You you kind of want to let Gibson kind of hang himself. And, you know, death, what you're doing is you're actually taking this spot out. Because uh, now you can no longer make a two-tile play and make Gibson's life really, really miserable. Um, something, you know, that's the kind of thing you kind of want to keep in mind. You know, at some point you might have to make a play through the D here, but, you know, you'd much rather make his life miserable by, you know, leaving these sorts of spots open or leaving forks open. Uh, the J is actually pretty good because of the forking potential. If it weren't for the C blocking it, you could create you know, some sort of fork. Stuff like that. Um, and he has to deal with this somehow. Although that's not too difficult to do. He'll be able to do that actually pretty easily. Um, yeah, so maybe Hodge there with the intent of on a subsequent turn 
playing on top of Hodge in a way that opens the top of the board again, something like that, maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, you kind of want you you really want to focus on these quadrants, and you want to leave the hook places alone as much as you can. Yeah, that's a good way of counteracting it. This board's like a little bit weird. It's maybe not the ideal spot to always do that. You know, in the long run, um, just because this quadrant is kind of a little bit miscomposed, but yeah. You know, you can always create some sort of other opening. You know, he eventually he's going to want to deal with this, and eventually you can just delay him long enough that such a play over here is going to be really effective a huge portion of the time. I mean, he can always have the S himself. I mean, that's always a thing. So this, you know, like I said, there's two blanks and three S's out, so this might not be necessarily an ideal spot to do this at this portion of the game, because there's, you know, you can just catch up normally. You don't really need to worry about the board closing yet. But if this were a more closed position later in the game with a different pool, that would definitely be something you'd want to keep in mind. So, yeah. Um, do you have any questions or underlying uh, thoughts? No, that was, that was very informative. Um, I certainly think David is a good player to, you know, just going back to the general um, task of kind of scouting out matchups and seeing how somebody plays and strategies that are applicable to individual opponents. David is certainly um, more a, a more striking kind of uh, person to choose because his strategy is very unique. Um, but you know, some of the some of these same ideas definitely apply to other players whose um, strategies and ideas don't really differ that much from whatever theoretical norm. I'm not even sure how you define that. Um, but, you know, there's you could do this against pretty much anybody. Um, I certainly, I post lots of my own games, so if anybody's curious about me, there's plenty of uh, fodder. If you want to know how to play better against me, um, maybe it's not the smartest idea, but I don't I have learned a lot going through games from other people, so I feel like it's nice to give back in that way. Yeah, it's always kind of a you know conundrum of how much information you give. Um, one of the things you know, I've definitely used this against other players, um, most notably Dave Weekend, who you know mostly doesn't play anymore, but used to post all of his games. Um, and I told him, it's like if you're gonna post all of your games, I'm gonna look at all of your games, and they did. <laughs> And about a, about three months later, she stopped. <laughs> yeah, so it, you know it's tough, and I'm sure you know it's it's possible that it's not something that I should be doing to maximize my own winning chances. But there's many many other strong players that I can think of that all do this, and it's kind of a community building thing, and we're all helping each other do better against one another. So you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. It's that kind of thing. It's okay to take a small, short-term hit and let people know the way that you play. Um, if you're looking to the greater good of the game and strategy developing beyond what it is now, so I think um, I'm pretty comfortable with my choice. But maybe and someday I'll. You can always tired. adjust, and you can no, always I readjust. How I play. <laughs> I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like, you know, Gibson can watch this video and, you know, adapt. There's plenty of adaptation that goes on, and that's part of the game. That's healthy. That's a healthy part of the metagame of most games. I wish that more people would do it. It's it's not like you're stuck with the strategy that you have. Yeah, this might hurt Gibson in the short run. I'm certain that it'll hurt whoever else is in the long run, but you, you know, First of all, posting those games lets you have a conversation with other people about, okay, these are the things that you do, you know, these are the things that works, these are the things that you can be used, you know, that people might do use against you or figure out some other way. And, sure. you know, that's, that's part of the game. That's, you know, everybody adapts to each other and all of a sudden you develop a metagame, which is healthy and which 
I hope that Scrabble gets more into that, where people are adapting not just to what the best move is, but what the other players are doing. And, you know, that's... It's not just for top players like David Gibson either. You know, if you have a local 1700 or 1800 player and you can get a hold of their games and you can get a hold of some games from just about anybody, you can do this. Um, and it's a really useful yeah. tool against... Yeah, you know, it's easier than you think. Um, you just have to kind of trust your instinct and look at... Do your best to come up with a move that you would pick and then see what move the person you're looking at picked and just like we did with David um, you try to tease out the thought process a lot of the time you know I'll explain my thought process in the games that I post so you can sometimes uh, you can see by the things that I leave out sometimes I omit things in my explanation that I look when I look back later at some of the games I've posted and I, I can't believe that I wasn't thinking about some element of the board or some element of um, my, you know, my opponent's strategy. Uh, sometimes the, the comments I leave out say almost as much as the things that I say in my commentary on the game. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways to do this sort of analysis. Right. Uh, I think it's kind of fun, to be honest. I, I went through no, I, I looked at David games and I looked at a handful of other really, really strong players' games, and I found it to be one of the most helpful things that I've ever done for my own game. Yeah. And there's a you can learn a lot from these games. You know, you, you don't just, you know, look at these things for exploitation. A lot of times you have to look at these sorts of games and you say to yourself, well, that's not what I would have done, and then you think about it for a little while and say, well, maybe that's maybe what I should have done. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can learn a lot from that, too. Absolutely. Um, it's also worth noting not every player is as unusual as Gibson. Um, you know, you're going to notice a lot. Gibson's kind of in his own world in a lot of ways. He has yeah, a very that's, unique that's style. What I was driving at before, you know, it, it's not going to be quite so easy with the majority of players to find these very um, striking decisions that are so far out of the norm. Um, David is a great choice. Uh, to illustrate how this type of analysis is performed, but it takes a little deeper digging for, I would say, most other players to come up with these sorts of uh, moves that they would make that almost nobody else would make. Some people don't really ever make moves like that, or very, very rarely, if ever. Um, so it's it's a different beast for most other players. You're absolutely right. Alright, so I think that covers most of what this video is. If you have any comments, uh, feel free to leave them in the comment section, and hope you enjoyed. Until next time. Hi guys, thanks for having me.